Let me take a break. Sure, take the ending to Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's webinar called Working the Ball. Here's Brendan Cooper with Tiffany Greens Golf Club in Kansas City, Missouri. Go Chiefs! And uh, as always, we're brought to you by Medicus Golf and Kick X Golf. If you have any questions, just put them in the sidebar there on your screen, and we will get to them as we get going. So uh, we have one more webinar this year, which will be next Friday. It will be an hour earlier. And then we're going, to, we're going to go back through and look at the topics during the year that we have gotten the most questions on and requests on. Yeah. We're not going to tell you what they are, but we'll have that all compiled. That will be next week. So we're going to take a break until after the first of the year. We've got to you know, lose a little weight, go pay off all those credit card charges for Christmas. Oh. Oh. Well, especially when you have two little young ones. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when it comes to working the ball, a lot of you hit one shot and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that that's fine. But we're going to go through the things you need to understand in order to work the ball, curve it in both directions. Yeah. It doesn't mean you'll be able to do it right away, but it's a thing that you can practice on. And even if you over curve it, if you're trying to hit like a little five yard fade and you hit a 30 yard fade, right. Slice, yeah. <laughs> uh, you still curve the ball in the correct direction. Yeah, we just have to minimize the amount of curve. Yeah, right? the, tri the trick is, is is trying to get it to curve the direction you're wanting it to curve. Even if you overdo it, that's fine. Like Chuck said, at least you went that way. Now just figure out a way to tone it down some. Right, right. So we're going to talk about the things that generate the curve. So, so the ball will always curve away from the path, depending on where the club face was relative to that path. Right. So if you're wanting to curve the ball uh, right to left, let's say, and you get up to the top of your swing and as you come down, your face is open, too much open to that path you're swinging on, you're probably not going to draw that shot. Correct. Okay. It's going to be high right. <laughs> yeah. Conversely, if you are trying to hit a fade and you swing down, you have the face overly closed to that path, you're going to hit a draw. Four left. Yeah. <laughs> so just remember, if you want to, if you want to draw the ball, the face has to be closed to the path. The path is what the club head is swinging on. Yeah. Not to the target line. If you want to fade it, the face needs to be open to that path. Okay. Uh, and again, not to target line. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So, what you've got to look at, we'll do a couple of things here. So, if I've got a couple of lines on here, and we'll use it facing you guys. So, if I'm trying to draw this ball, I need to have the face, okay, or the path, to the right, or right-hander, of the ball. So, you can see how that angles it that direction. Okay, so the spin is going to go this way, come around back the other way. I'm going to fade it, it's just the opposite. The face is to the right of the path, and that gets the ball coming back. Right. Now, the wider this dispersion is, the more it's going to curve. So if your ball is over curving, that just means your dispersion is way too much. Yeah, the difference, between, yeah, the difference between the two is, is too much, and then you've got to figure out, well, <laughs> Face or is it more path that I need to tone down some? Right, right. Uh, you know, we have a question up on our uh, uh, golfer's playbook training space talking about, you know, why do most people slice their drivers, but they don't do it with their iron? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's a couple of things. I mean, basically, you know, the driver has less loft than your pitching wedge. Right. The driver spins more than your pitching wedge. And if you're hitting down with the driver, that makes it spin even more. Yeah. So when you get that ball with the driver too far back from your from your left shoulder, that means you're now hitting down on it, and hitting down is going to increase that speed. Yeah. Right. And increase the spin. 
So two things you don't want in a driver is, is low trajectory and, and uh, high spin. Yeah, that's not a good recipe. No, you want high trajectory, high launch, low spin. Right. Okay. All right, so now let's go over a couple things here. Um, we're going to set this vision track out. Now, this is an older version. We got it out because it's bigger and you guys can see better with it, I think. All right, so I'm going to turn this around and just put this back here and then put the travel bar out here. So hopefully you guys can see this. It's, it's Again, it's a lot bigger than the one we normally use. So if I'm set up to this, and my sweet spot is swinging along this line, which we refer to as the sweet spot path or the alternate target line, you'll see that that is pointed to the right of this target. Okay? Because that's where I want the ball to go for a draw. So I'm swinging down here, and as I come down, I just need to make sure my face is closed relative to this line. Correct. But if we, if, again, if we, I'll stick this, let me grab this rod, white rod here so you see it. So we, that way y'all can see an extension of target line. So if that's an extension of target line, again, the thing we keep stressing the most is it doesn't have to do with the target line, it's the path the sweet spot's on. Right. So that's very critical because a lot of students say, well, my face was closed to my target line. Forget target line. Right. It's the path. Right. And depending, depending on the shot, if you had two of these, it would look like, it would look like I don't know if you can see it, I've got this angle over here at Foxman saying that angle is this one. So if, and ideally, if I had a driver and it's up here at my, uh, at my target side shoulder, when I strike that ball, I'm immediately going to take this angle that I just swung down on, and I'm going to mirror it to the other side of it. Now, when you do that and you're hitting up, you need to aim your path to the right. Because we're going up with it, not down with we're it. We're going up. Uh, because if you were set square to hit that shot, it would just start over here, start left, and continue to go left. Yeah. But remember, anytime you're swinging a golf club, if you know, balls on the ground with, with irons, in order to hit them effectively, the sweet spot's got to be moving down. Well, as the sweet spot's moving down, it's also moving out. So with a driver, we're not trying to hit down on it. We're trying to hit it more on the upswing. So that's going to make the sweet spot work more to the left. So that's that's very critical as well to understand when you're trying to work the ball or fade the ball. So Right, right. Uh, you know, Brendan's got this cool little toy. We used it. And it's actually up on the training space, too. And since it's his toy, I'm going to let him use it. It's not mine, it's my son's. I stole it from him. So. No, we didn't have that choice. It, it kind of <laughs> is. It kind of is. Okay, so back up here just a little bit. Let me get this out of there. All right, so go ahead and just face them. Okay. All right, so if you're somebody that in the, in, in the downswing, you really, the idea is to make this all come in one line over here. This thing will extend. You can see how it extends out. So if you're someone that takes the club to the top and then you extend it back here, What's going to happen is your club face is actually going to be closing when you hit the ball. So that's going to result in a pull. Yep. Okay. Yep. So ideally, we want to extend it over here. Right there. That's where we want the full extension. Okay. It's handy. It's handy. Not bad. He's a, he's a force is strong with this young Catalan. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, Star Wars comes out on December 18th. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. Yes, yes. So, anyway, just remember, if you're going to work the ball, uh, here, here's a couple of on-course things. In fact, I was talking about one of the members at lunch today. You know, when, you're, when you have an approach shot into a green and you have tucked pins, uh, the, the best advice, if you're not really good at working it or you tend to overcurve it, is just hit it at the middle of the green. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, mid, the middle never moves. But yeah, it, you're going to be okay on that. And normally on par threes, those are the smallest greens on the golf course. So you're not going to have a very long putt anyway. But let's say you get pretty proficient at curving that ball. Well, again, you want to start it at the middle, but whatever curve you choose, whether it's a left pin and you're drawing it for a right-hander, or a right pin and you're fading it, just aim at the middle again. And if it does the amount of curve you want, great. Um, if it doesn't curve, you're still going to be okay. Yeah. You know? uh, and typically, if you overcurve it, you still won't hit it outside the green. Exactly. Now, if you're longer clubs, you'll have a better chance of hitting it outside the green. But when you've got eight iron down, let's say, 
you can pretty much pick your spot 10, 12 feet, right or left of the pin, and just hit it towards that spot. And if it curves a little bit, that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to cover on this? No, I, I think, uh, because <coughs> piggyback off what Chuck was just saying right there, is, you know, if you find that it's easier for you to draw it or fade it, well, use that to your advantage. Um, you know, like Chuck was saying, if, if you know, you're, it's easier for you to hit a draw shape, well, then those pins that are favored more of the draw, those will be ones you can be more aggressive with. Right. Where if the pin uh, asks for more of a fade shot, don't get too flirtatious with it. Right. You know, even the best players in the world know when a green light pin is in front of them and when a yellow light's in front of them. Right. So a lot of times, you know, a pin will say it's you're tuck more for a fade and people are trying to hit a draw in there. Well, you don't need to do that unless you absolutely have to. Well, and, and the other thing is that if you've got a right-hand pin and you're trying to hit a draw, that means you have to start the ball outside the confines of the green. And normally there's trouble. Yeah, and, and if it doesn't draw enough, or any at all, do you have short-sighted yourself? Yeah. So again, in those situations, just if you're a drawer of the ball, instead of aiming at the middle, aim it at the flag. If it doesn't draw, you're okay. If it draws a little, you're okay. If it draws a lot, you still should be okay. Yeah. So the rule is don't aim outside the edges of the green. That's yeah. that's the primary rule. Yeah. Same thing in the fairways. Okay. Don't aim outside the edges of the fairways. Unless you're Bubba. Yeah, unless you're Bubba. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we got a bunch of questions, so let's get to them. The first question is from Dan. David Ledbetter recently wrote a book about the new swing he developed. It's called the A-Swing, which is also highlighted in Golf Digest. It features an extremely uh, upright backswing, and his student, uh, Simon Fing, was medalist by seven shots at the recent LPGA school. Your comments or thoughts on the A-Swing? Well, David sent me a copy of it. Uh, the ace wing is really nothing new. There have been players forever. You can, you can I mean, Jim Jarrett basically does the ace wing. Okay. Uh, if it works for you, that's fine. Right. Uh, more than not, we see people get the club trapped behind them. So all you're trying to do is keep the club head out in front of your hands more. And instead of working the club this way, you're actually working the club this way and across the line so that you, hopefully you'll come back down that way. Yeah. We see players do that day in and day out. None of them can play a lick. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, but having said that, uh, again, it, anything will work for the right person. Exactly, it, it, like Chuck said, it's a way to do a swing. Yeah, it's called a <laughs> swing. It's a way to do a swing. Uh, you know, if natural golf work for you, do that. Yeah. You know, if the eight-step swing for it works for you, do that. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever the concept is, if it falls within what we call, what we call those five key areas, the five simple keys, uh, steady head, pressure forward, uh, inline club shaft, sweet spot plane, and then club head control or, or club face control, if it falls within those, yeah. anything will work. So you just have to test it and try it for yourself. And if, if it does, great. If it doesn't, Go do something else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next question. This one is from John. Having played for almost 40 years, I've had my handicap fluctuate from 7 to 18 quite a few times. Do you think that taking private lessons from trained, seasoned, thanks for the word seasoned, John, instead of old, uh, as yourself is the only way to get a golfer better? Do you offer video analysis lessons? Uh, Yes, we do. We do them through our online portal at, uh, at, at Edgeify. You can email me for information, chuck at chuckevansgolf.com, and we'll give you that information. It's always good to work with, with a teaching pro if you find the right one. Um, I would recommend not working with someone that teaches a methodology, right? because if you don't fit within that method, you're not going to have much success. Exactly. So look for someone that is not set in stone that will basically just take out the things in your swing that aren't functioning properly and improve those areas to where all those pieces make. Right. You know, that's that's something we tell all of our students is that, you know, Chuck and myself, we're, we're not trying to take a round peg and smash it into a square hole. I mean, we, we understand that, you know, just like we were talking about the A swing a minute ago, there's a multitude of ways to do it. 
We've just got to figure out, all right, what's the best way for you as the player for what it is you're doing. Right. So I mean, and again, we've used versions, if you want to call it that, of the A-swing. If we've had people that, that have gone here and then gone there, well, we'll have them do the opposite. Go here and go there. Yeah. You know, so, so again, yeah, find someone that's been around the block a few times but is not stuck in a, in a methodology, right? And will help you find a way that, that, and that is the easiest, A, on your body, B, you do the things that your body already wants to do, and C, that you can easily replicate. Yeah. Okay. So you've been around the block. I've been That's around the block a hundred times. Yeah. Okay, next question. Okay, this question is from Gary. What is the proper motion of the left wrist arm until after impact? Does it actually start to break so the right wrist can straighten, or does it rotate to a palm up orientation? We can do, we can do both. All of them. Yeah. I mean, if we, you know, I mean, if I had this club here, I mean, you know, like we've talked so many times before, when we get down to impact, we're trying to have shaft and lead arm in line, all off flat left wrist. But now once I go from here to post impact and after post impact, if it wants to break a little, it can break. Some players, it will remain flat and then it will do a full swivel here at the, at the halfway point on the follow through. So, you know, whatever it's doing post impact, again, you've heard me say it before, it's kind of cosmetic based on what's going on prior to impact. But we're mainly concerned with impact to post is what we're looking at. All right, so if you get it from from impact, what we would deem follow through, whatever happens past that doesn't really make any difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's whatever you feel like. Um, generally, you do not want to try to be taking this club and doing this motion because all you're going to do is you're really going to rotate the face hard. Yeah. And if you're trying, if you're trying to hit a fade. That won't produce a fade generally. Good luck. Good luck. And there's, and there's a lot of timing involved. Yes. A lot. All right, next question. Hey, here it is. Air. Do you use the same ball position for draws or fades? You can. Depends. <laughs> Depends. You can. Um, if you move the ball back, think of it from a logical standpoint if I had the ball the farthest back would my pass be more in to out or more out to in okay same thing I'm going to move it too far forward so I'm going to show you from this angle if I had the ball I'm going to put the ball forward up here I'm just going to make the normal swing and come down to the ball I'm going to move to the, as far back watch the same motion you see how much more that comes from the inside well, if I'm coming that much from the inside, uh, my only hope is to hit a draw. Yeah. All right, because the path is going too far to the right, so I need to adjust the club face. So you can do a different ball position, but you don't have to do a different ball position. You can change what you're doing with your club face relationship to the path, no matter what ball position. Exactly. Exactly. All right, next question. We haven't heard from Air in a couple weeks, I don't think. Oh, he's been on vacation, I think. Uh, this is from Bob. When trying to work the ball, should you turn the hands through impact or set the angle of, of the head, then make a normal swing? Again, that uh, kind of depends, you know, on the player. I mean, some players, I, I know for, if I'm talking, you know, me personally, um, I'm adjusting it. I'm more of a feel and I'm doing a lot of things in swing on the downswing and I'm feeling what my hands are doing. So if I'm trying to, I mean, I'm a natural drawer of the ball. I mean, if I hit a five yard draw, Chuck calls it a fade. So I'm, I'm a drawer. So if I'm trying to really crank a draw in there, then I'll kind of what we talked about a second ago, I'll move the ball back even more. And I will really try to on the downswing feel like I am rotating my hands a little bit earlier. So getting the face to try down, to down and trying to get it to right. really roll through there. So some players can do that. Some players, it's easier just to go ahead and adjust your stance line, face line at the start and right. go go that route. Yeah, and, and when you set the face again, to hit a draw or a fade, here, here here's the deal: you need to set the club face where you want the ball to start. So if I'm going to draw it, that ball needs to start 
a right-hander to the right. So my face is not going to be square to the target line. It's actually going to look to the right of the target line. Then I'm going to make my body lines, which control the path, point farther right than my face angle. Now, just swing along your body line. What we see too, too often, though, is when people get there, they still try to make the same, the same backswing they made from the square stance. Right. Well, it is the same. I mean, if I'm, if I'm set up square, this is a motion going back. Now, if I'm set up closed, I still make the same motion, but relative to the target line, it's a lot more inside. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, another question. This is our last question. So if you guys are on here, you better jump on. All right, Paul, I have no problem drawing the ball. However, when trying to fade, I often come over the top and get a, a double cross, dead pull left. I can hit an intentional slice, but my fade is never consistent. My big miss seems to be a big block to the right, which seems to occur only late, early or late in my round. So, so here's the deal, Paul. Uh, if you normally hit a draw, okay, you know that A, the club face is pointed to the right and the path is to the right of that. So it would be really hard to come over the top. You, what you may be sensing uh, is not a really an over-the-top move. Mm -hmm. It's the club face is just pointed left. Yeah. Okay. But your path is not far enough left of the club face. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because again, generally players that hit a draw when they try to get a fade, they don't swing over the top. They just get the club face relationship confused. Yeah. And right. This is this is a great example of, of a player that's in our program because he what he thought was over the top was still. I mean, the sweet spot was still moving three or four degrees inside, but he was having a hard time controlling what the face was doing. So right. with this particular player, I actually had him set up at a dress and open the face just a little bit, and then he was getting the feel of coming more, using more of the right shoulder, feeling like it was working outward more, but not doing anything with the face. Right. And that started producing more fades and, and kind of tone some things down. And now that he's got a feel for what his hands are doing, now we've got the face going a little bit more square. But, you know, that's something you can kind of play around with at the start is go ahead and get, do your normal setup, but open the face just a little bit, do your normal backswing, and then on the downswing, feel like you're trying to come over with the right shoulder more with no no face movement at all. Right. And, and what will happen is when you're doing that move, so let's say, for instance, that I was swinging down, I get the club down into right here. As you can see where the club head is back here. So if I, if I make that same move, I'll let the club head travel out a little bit this direction. That's not outside in. No. Okay. It just moved my path to the left. Yeah. Okay. But it is not outside in. No. No. All right. I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you, guys. Uh, we will see you next week. Go Chiefs. Hey, the Cowboys still have hope. They are still <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they can win that division at 5-11. Uh, Oh, playoffs, baby. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys. Thanks.